Daddy, I want to take karate. And my father goes, kicking is for girls. I said, but Dad, Bruce Lee's not a girl. My father goes, you made your point. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 356. And today, I'm joined by Kyoshi Herbie Bagwell. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. And I'm the guy who gets to talk to other martial artists and call it work. It's the best job I could ever imagine. And I thank you for your support and allowing me to do it. Now, part of the way that you support us is by shopping, whether it's at Amazon or maybe your school has a wholesale account with us where you buy uniforms or gear or whatever else that we, we make, or you shop directly at whistlekick.com. Now, if you go over there, you can use the code podcast15 to save 15% on everything. And what we have is changing almost every day, usually, usually a couple times a week. New designs, new inventory, lots of stuff happening there. So make sure you check that out, whistlekick.com. If you want to check out the show notes, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've got photo, video, transcripts, and all the other 355 episodes are available for free. So check that out. Now, today's guest got emotional. He got real. He was open in a way that so few, maybe if any guests, have ever gotten on this show. I was honored at his trust for me and for this audience that he was willing to be that way. And the conversation we had, the lessons that came out, man, this is great stuff. One of my favorite episodes of late. So I hope that you enjoy this episode, this conversation that I was so fortunate enough to have with Kyoshi Herbie Bagwell. Kyoshi Bagwell, welcome to Whistlekick yeah. Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. No, oh, I appreciate you. I appreciate having you. You know, I, I got to say, I haven't known you for very long, but every time I see you, it <laughs> feels like I've known you a lot longer than I have. It, do people say that about you? You just seem like a really genuine, friendly guy. Well, you know, I'm just totally, completely uninhibited. And, you know, there's no secret with me. There's uh, no tricks to the tray with me. I'm wide open, grew up in the church. So um, the best thing, the best way I can answer it is just the God in me. I want people to feel, you know, uh, comfortable around me. And um, that's what people are looking at. They're looking at my light. So that's very nice of you to say. Thank you. Oh, well, you're welcome, and thank you. And and I'm certainly not the only one who's made that observation. I've spoken about you to a couple others, and and people have nothing but positive things to say, which is why I asked you to come on the show. Thank you so because much. Because I have a feeling. Of course, thank you. The honor is mine, because you know I have the best job in the world. I get to talk to martial artists about martial arts, and I get to call it work. And I mean, what's what's better than that? Absolutely. So let's let's go back. Let's roll back it. Everybody's got a beginning, right? There's there's an origin story to your martial arts journey somewhere. So let's go back and why don't you tell us about that? How did you find martial arts? Oh, how much time do we have? <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> well, let's see. I was born 1965 in New London, Connecticut, and um, I'm 53 years of age. So I've been in, I've been in martial arts now. Oh my gosh, 40. Five years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. Five years. Yeah. Long time. And um my first love is boxing, actually. Um okay. my father knew the Bronx bomber, Joe Lewis. He actually um had a drink with him back in the forties and the fifties. <clears throat> and um it was it was boxing that my father first turned me on to. And I always had fast hands. And for as small as I was, I was a small, skinny kid. I was also, I also had power in my hand. So I would say coming out of the womb, so to speak, I had little cute little boxing gloves. There's a ton of pictures that my sister um, has saved over the years. And of course, the pictures are like black and white and all messed up looking pictures. But you can definitely see um, me and these pictures holding boxing gloves, my father, my mom around, um, that went through, I would say late sixties into the early seventies. But the mistake my father made was he took me to a drive-in movie 
with a friend of mine, a bunch of kids, I should say, from the neighborhood. We went to go see, in 1973, Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon. (laughs) (laughs) And that was, and that was it. I lost my mind. And I said, Daddy, I want to take karate. And my father goes, kicking is for girls. I said, but Dad, Bruce Lee's not a girl. My father goes, you made your point. (laughs) So we went to a uh, karate school in New London. It was uh, Goju, G-O-J-U, Goju Karate, which is Japanese. And the instructor was a man named Chuck Merriman, who is known all over the world. Um, Don't know if you've heard him before. But um, he's been on the show. Oh, wow. How funny is that? Yeah. Oh, and absolutely. So, yep. So Chuck Merriman and I had um, linked up um, on Facebook, so to speak, and he remembered me. And and um, we were, it was just very, my eyes were just watery to reconnect with him after all these years. And he just kept saying, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Look at you with school and your students and tournaments and all of my awards. I'm in two Hall of Fames, um, well, you know, children, kids, life, you know, life. And he was just so proud of me. Um, but ultimately, we went down to Chuck Merriman School, um, I'd say circa 1974-ish, 73-74. And um, when I got into karate class, it was, it was nothing like the movie. <laughs> nothing <laughs> at all. Like the movie, it was a wake up call, and um, but Chuck Merriman captured my my interest. He piqued my interest, and he was just a phenomenal instructor. I met people like Domingo Llanos. I met people. Um, we saw Chuck Norris come in there a few times. Um, Bill Superfoot Wallace came in there a few times which really freaked us out to see Chuck Norris. I mean, here's a guy who fought Bruce Lee in Return of the Dragon, which we were just, we lost our mind. But they were all friends of Chuck Merriman, you know? And um, so that was my beginning, you know, in karate with Goju Karate in the early 70s. That was it. Wow. Wow. You know, I didn't know your history, you know, and, and I don't know a lot about you, but mm-hmm. um, there there are only... Three people now who've been on the show who have been able to say that, or maybe maybe two, maybe you're only the, the second one. Of course, we've we've had Hanshi Ron Martin on the show oh, who started with with Merriman Sensei. Yes, I know Ron. Uh, yeah, I love Ron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's a great guy. Um, but wow, you know, I I didn't I didn't see that coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't see that and, coming. Uh, because, you know, and you know. Go ahead. No, 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 please continue. Yeah, so then after uh, I was with Chuck Merriman, oh my gosh, say 74, 75, all through 70s, and I was just doing football and martial arts. And then my speed came out of nowhere playing in a basketball game. And uh, one of the cute little girls at the neighborhood said, you should run track. Now I'm about 13 years of age, and um, now I increased my activity, which is keeping me out of the house even more. But, um, you know, the busier you are, you know, the less the devil can have a playground in your brain. So um, I got in the track and field and got my speed, and I was getting my wind up, my cardiovascular, getting better condition. And I wanted to explore other things now. And so 1978, I got involved with uh, Kempo Martial Arts, K-E-M-P-O, because there's Ken Po, which is more of an Ed Parker system. And then there's Kempo, K-E-M-P-O, which is the original. That is Fred Villari. And Fred Villari and Ed Parker and all those guys used to train together. Professor Serio, they all used to train together years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I got involved with Kempo, which is Fred Villari's system. And um, I was under Kempo under Sifu Tim Raynor. I don't know if you know who he is. 
I don't, but I have heard the name. Yeah, and Tim and Tim Raynor, he and I again hooked up through um, Facebook, which is a wonderful social media. It's kind of watch what you put on there. People don't like social media only because they put nonsense on there. You can't you can't do that. Just you know, take it for what it is. Be careful. But anyway, um, seafood Tim Raynor, what really fascinated me with Kempo was the close quarter combat. It was just fast and it was just amazing. And that was the closest thing to Bruce Lee I've ever seen, was watching Sifu Tim Raynor's hands and his feet. And um, I've been in Kempo ever since. So you figure 13 and I'm now 53. You're talking, yeah, 40 years in Kempo. And uh, then I got involved with, um, then I got involved with Taekwondo, I would say, oh my goodness, senior year in high school. Um, he was, at the time, it was, um, Sensei Leroy Jones. Um, he's now Grandmaster Jones. Um, Grandmaster Leroy Jones is about oh, mid 80s. And all these men knew my father. And so, therefore, they knew a whole lot about me. And that really has built my character of just being strong um, and being who I am as a man I am today. So, that's my martial arts history. So I was in Goju, went to went to Kempo, and after Kempo, um, I kept taking. I kept on with Kempo, kept studying that, and I then I went into Taekwondo. So I teach Taekwondo and Kempo today. Ninth degree black belt in Kempo, fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo. Um, have my own style called Tay Kempo martial arts. Obviously, it's a combination of the two. Um, I made one Hall of Fame. Um, with Tay Kempo Martial Arts, and I'm in the second Hall of Fame. I'm in the Don Rodriguez Hall of Fame as of April 2018. So, being in two Hall of Fames, I have uh, two karate schools, I have two TV shows, I have, um, as of yesterday, um, 195 karate students. Um, praise God, doing well, doing well. Yeah. Man, now that that's that is a great intro and gives us a lot of stuff to unpack. But let's start. Let's start with the style stuff. You know, yeah. anybody who knows much about Taekwondo and Kempo as individual arts, I've actually actively trained in both. Mm -hmm. Know how different they are. The difference in not just technique but in philosophy. Everything. So can yeah. you? Yeah. Can can you talk about why you maintained active training in both? and why you feel it's important to present both to your students. Right. Well, I'm also writing a book right now, and it's going to be called Tay Kempo Martial Arts. And I'm out, I'm on the fifth chapter right now, and I'm trying not to go like 30 chapters. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's so much. And there's um, a lot. Yeah, and I'm on the fifth chapter, and I'm only on, I would say, in the advanced part now. And so I'm trying to keep it, like hit it and quit it, like James Brown's song, because I have people who are already published. They're like, Herbie, keep your first book short and sweet. Then, praise God, this one does well. Then people are going to come after you for the second book. I said, I got you. So that book should be coming out, I would say, in spring. Um, but the two styles, and I fought in a lot of tournaments a lot of tournaments throughout the country, overseas. I fought around the world. And what I find is, for me, this is just for me, and no disrespect to anyone else, but I have a lot of self-respect. Um, I find that for me, to take one style and go from there, um, it's almost going to put me to sleep. And it's not the instructor, it's not the style, it's just that I need a lot more stimuli. So I've always been called, quote unquote, an overachiever. People who are millionaires and billionaires say that doesn't even exist. You just want a whole lot out of life because God has put it on you to go get it. I'm a go get it person. So um, no excuses here, All, only results. But um, the two styles, Taekwondo and Kempo really intrigued me. When, first of all, when a person wants to expand to attack you, by using both styles, 
you can contract not only to defend, but still to be able to strike. And then when a person wants to contract, you can expand and still be able to defend and attack. And people look at me like, really? And I go, well, I got like 12 black belts underneath me now. I don't know how many overall champions, grand champions, um, triple crown champions, NASCA champions in weapons forms and fighting. Um, this may offend a couple of some instructors, but when I see students, two students from the same school in the same division, and they're doing the same kata, that's laziness to me. It, it really is because you got two different personalities doing the same kata, especially in a in, in a competition. Now, when you're training and you're in the dojo or you're testing, well, yeah, they're all doing the same kata, but um, at the at the you know at the end of the day, um, people, when it comes to teaching, the two styles mix like peanut butter and jelly because it, it, it all depends how you're going to teach it. You gotta teach them in their purest forms. You teach Taekwondo in its purest form. You teach Kempo in its purest form. The only time you're gonna mix the two is when you fight. Now, others may want to debate with me and they can, that's fine. But my black belts can go anywhere in the world and teach a Taekwondo class. Now, there's two types of two types of Taekwondo. There's World Taekwondo and there's ITF, International Taekwondo Federation. We're, and, and I'm an ITF guy. And ITF is International Taekwondo Federation. We don't do Taeguk forms. We do ITF. That means Chunji, Dangun, Gosan, Wanyo. I don't know if you're familiar with those katas. I am. I am. Okay. That's I. I was. I was there last night. Fantastic. So, you know, <laughs> Taeguk forms is just different. Like Tang Sudo and Taekwondo, basically, it's almost like they were two brothers living in the same household taking Taekwondo. Something happened, they had a fallen out, and one brother calls it Tang Sudo now, and another brother still stays with Taekwondo. If you look at the two styles, they're so similar. Now, mm -hmm. The way they dress is different because a lot of Taekwondo people wear a gi, wear a white gi with like a black or red lapel, uh, 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 lapel piece. True International Taekwondo Federation, when you're an underbelt, that gi is white or it could be any other color. But when you see like a color on that lapel, some people look at that as a grand master uniform, but a lot of the underbelts are wearing those as well. But once again, you can't tell an instructor on how he or she can govern their own dojo. Right. So there's a lot of conflicting stuff, a lot of similarities, but as far as Bagwell Academy of Martial Arts is concerned, um, from, from white belt all the way to red black, you, you will see two uniforms, all white or blue. And once you hit that black belt or the junior black belt, I find that a lot of my students had to go back to an all white uniform. How funny is that? They go back to the traditional. Mm. You know, I, right. I might walk out on the dojo floor with a red top or with a white top or a blue or black, but it's solid. The lapel is never going to be the opposite color of the gi. So, again, Every, every instructor can govern his or her dojo as they would like. I would never knock anyone how they, how they run their house, how they raise their kids. That's completely up to them. It's under my business. But as far as Bagwell Academy of Martial Arts is concerned, I was always raised with the notion that stay with, the, stay with tradition. Don't break tradition. Stay with it. If you can improve it, then improve upon it, which I have but always stay with tradition. So yes, I teach Taekwondo in its purest form. I teach Kempo in its purest form in the, in the, in the pinyons and the combinations um, in the ground game with Kempo. We have six weapons in Te Kempo martial arts. We have the bow, we have the kama, we have the eskrima sticks, some call them Filipino fighting sticks. We have the tanfa, looks like a police knight stick, of course. We have the sword and the knife. We have six weapons in our arsenal in Te Kempo martial arts. 
one of the, I think, most passionately debated subjects in martial <clears throat> arts is that that reconciliation between honoring tradition mm -hmm. and advancing arts to adding things. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you think about both sides of that. Mm -hmm. How do you decide? How do you handle that? How do you honor the past and still move forward? That's the age old question. And this is why a lot of grandmasters respect me. Wherever I go around the country, wherever I go, I always pay homage. It's the past that got us here to the present. If there was no Henry Ford, if there was no uh, Thomas Edison, if, if there was no Sojourner Truth, uh, if there was no Martin Luther King, if, if there was uh, no John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, uh, Westinghouse, uh, what's, the, what's my other man's name? Vanderbilt, you know, you know if, if there wasn't people like that, we wouldn't be here. So you have to, you have to honor the past, but if you can build off of that, that, there's your foundation. And if you can build off the foundation, like they say, training on the shoulders of geniuses, they want you to be creative. They want you to advance what they've done. They want that. That's why records were meant to be broken. They want you to be better and faster, bigger athletes today. They want that. You know, you know the, the law of nature demands it. You just can't be the same way. There are some old antiquated people out here who don't want to grow. Some people are afraid of advancement. They're afraid of growth. They're afraid of, of, of uh, success. I have a lot of adult friends that are afraid of success. I'm telling you the truth. It sounds like it's crazy, but they are afraid of success. You know, people told me um, 2010 when I opened up my, my karate school here in Milford, Connecticut, I wouldn't be opened up six months. <laughs> That was eight and a half years ago. Hello. So, I mean, listen, you tell me something negative. I won't get mad at you. Mm -mm. I'm going to use that negativity as fuel to add on to my already passionate fire. And I'm just going to just prove people wrong with my success. I'm not going to disrespect you. I'm not going to debate with you. I'm not going to get into an argument. You're not going to steal my peace. I'm not giving anyone that kind of power to steal my peace. But to further answer your question, someone discovered Kempo, someone discovered Taekwondo, someone discovered it, someone discovered Aikido, someone you know uh, discovered um, Shizuru, uh, someone discovered Judo, someone discovered wrestling, Greco-Roman wrestling. Listen, wrestling was around before Greco-Roman. It was. They just took it and did certain things with it. Think about it. Think about it. Henry Ford yeah, had a yeah. Henry Ford had the Model T. We got cars that can do 200 miles per hour. You can buy off the showroom floor. Henry Ford would be blown away if he could see what today modern world is. John D. Rockefeller. He's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite um, people in this world. I don't care about his personal life and how what he did. I don't care about that. I look at that man as an innovator. That man came from nothing, from Cleveland. And that man's family, they can't even spend the interest off his money of what he did, to the, you did for this country. Now, you can knock him, but you have to also honor him. You got me? A lot of black folks in the South, they want to they wanna knock all white people, but it was still a white man who freed us from slaves. Am I right or wrong? So, listen, people can say what they want to say. But at the end of the day, innovation is what nature demands of us. You have to free your mind. You have to open your mind. You have to, I'm a spiritual man, so I hope I don't offend you, anyone, anyone of your listeners, but I ask God every day to give me a new mind so I can be open to God's blessings, so I can be in God's blessings way, so I can be creative. I can have a, have a new mind. You can't go from year to year to year with, you know, with an old mindset. The Bible says God cannot put new wine in old wine skin. 
So you have to get a new and fresh mind. You have to be on the cutting edge of things. You have to read. You have to, you know, a lot of Christians don't like this word called meditate, but you have to meditate, get in your quiet space at least once a day. You have to. Cut all the noise out. Turn the cell phone off. You got to park your car by the beach and put your hands on the steering wheel and take a deep breath and hold it and exhale and be and just be still and be quiet for like five minutes and then go back into your day. You have to be still. You have to be on the cutting edge. My father, who was born 1920, he grew up in a he grew up in a time in this country where if you're walking down the street and if a white person was walking towards you, he had to cross the street, risk getting hit by a trolley, risk getting hit by uh, horse and carriage. That's how it was back then. So my point of bringing that up is, look how far we've come. Innovation is something that nature demands. So you have to be able to change. You have to be able to have a new mind, to be open and be creative. And not be afraid to fail. I didn't say be perfect. Do not be afraid to fail. That's how this country was built. Carnegie Steel. They're like steel. Nobody needs steel. Steel's a waste of time. Who needs steel? Wood is just everything. Wood is natural. Okay. You can't count the steel bridges today. (laughs) You can't count the big, strong structures today. You have to be innovative. You have to be creative. You have to be on the cutting edge of things. You have to be. We're all going to go through our ups and downs in life, spiritually, mentally, physically, and financially. Okay, we're all going to have setbacks. But where I come from, a setback is a great time for God to give you a great comeback. You see, I'm, I'm just very positive. You know, I'm very positive. My glass is always half full. It's not half empty. When all hell is breaking loose in my life, I know that God's getting ready to bring me to the next level. And some folks can't handle chaos and turmoil. Oh, I can't take this. I don't want no more of this. I'm going to give up. Then God is saying, you're not ready to go to the next level. Because maybe that chaos and nonsense and all hell breaking loose in your life is training to get you to the next level. And if you complain about where you are, then that's going to cancel out God's blessings on you going to the next level. It's going to cancel it out because you're saying to yourself, I can't take this no more. I don't want this. I can't handle it. Then God is saying that you're not ready to go to the next level. Because if you can't handle what you're going through on this level, then you can't handle the next level that God has in store for you. You understand? So listen, hey, Kempo Martial Arts is built on that to answer your question. It's built on being innovative. You have to teach the way I teach. I teach three steps. And I don't tell many people this, but I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give it to you for free. (laughs) Appreciate it. Appreciate it. That's no doubt. Three steps. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you. And we're going to do it together. Once again, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to show you what we're going to do. And we're going to do it together. I'm a former school teacher. And those three steps right there, I gained the respect of kids quickly. I was a substitute teacher. And after a month of substitute teacher, the superintendent of schools came to my classroom and offered me a full-time position. But I'm retired law enforcement. Law enforcement was my life then for many, 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 many years. So I'm retired now. But at the end of the day, I was like, wow, thank you so much. And they wanted me to stay on. And when I was a substitute teacher, they gave me one of the worst classrooms. I was in New Haven, Connecticut. They gave me the, one of the worst classrooms. I won't say what school it was, but <laughs> it was one of the worst classes in that school. And after three days, teachers were going by there, going by my classroom, asking me, am I all right? I'm looking at them like, do I look like I'm all right? It's nice and quiet in here. Well, that's why we're coming by here, Mr. Bagwell, because it's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> because the former teacher... She couldn't handle these kids. She couldn't handle them. But then again, how many black male teachers do you see? How many black male teachers? I, I'll ask you a question. I already know what the answer is. How many black male uh, school teachers did, did you have from, say, kindergarten to high school and co- high school 
when you graduate? How many did you have? Well, to be fair, I did grow up in Maine, uh, but none. Doesn't matter where you grew up. I don't care if you grew up in Detroit, Michigan, or you grew up in the hood in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Even in Bridgeport, Connecticut, in New Haven, New York City. New York City is the only state that I'm told that has more black male teachers than anybody else place else in the country. From what I'm told, I don't know. I didn't check the statistics. Okay. You can double check that. You can go fact find it. But what's important to me is that me being a black male in the school system at that time, I did something different. I did something innovative. And I'm going to give this to you for free. <laughs> Love it. 99.9999% of all school teachers have their desk where? In front of the classroom, right? Right. My first day, I saw how rowdy these kids were. And I'm looking at them, and they're looking at me. And they, you could hear a pin drop when I walked in. Next thing I know, Hour and a half goes by. It was time for um, phys ed, gym class. I called the janitors in, like four of them, and I said, first things first, I want this room swept. I want the trash taken out. I want new blinds in this room. You got a half an hour. And they did it. When these students came back in, or prior to them coming back in, and I said, after you sweep and after you and, oh, I, I'm sorry. I said, clean the walls of all this negative graffiti. I want it clean because all water based. You take a big sponge, it comes right off. I, I want the walls clean. I want this room swept, and I want brand new blinds. And lastly, take my desk and put it in the back of the classroom. And that was the key, sir. When these students came in from physical education, I was sitting behind them. So I can keep an eye on them. You see the difference? Absolutely. All I'm doing is making a point. I'm making point after point after point. I'm being innovative. You have to be innovative. You have to be creative. You have to be smart. You have to know the people who you're dealing with. You have to know what you're dealing with. You have to have a plan. You have to be, you have to want to succeed. You have to want to be successful. My father died broke. I'm not dying broke. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not. I'm not going to die broke. I'm not going to die broke. My legacy is too important. God woke me up this morning, and God put too much into me for me to die broke. I'm just not going to do it. I'm probably one of your most spiritual, if not deep, <laughs> conversations or interviews you've had. And not to get long-winded, but at the end of the day, it's incumbent upon me. It's imperative that I leave behind a legacy of big feet. Who can fit these shoes that Herbie Bagwell, that Kiyoshi Herbie Bagwell has left? If you can't fit my shoes, then close down my karate schools, plural. And where the money falls, I hope it falls in my kids' pockets. If not, put it into a group home. Put it to good use. Because mm. at the end of the day, you have to be creative. And it has to make sense. I have too many success stories on Tay Kempo Martial Arts. It's success. I don't care about the haters. There's not a hater or a devil in the world that's going to stop a blessing that God has already preordained before the sands of time to give to me. And that's it. And that's why it's very creative. That's why Tay Kempo Martial Arts is amazing. And that's why I'm writing a book on it so people can read. And then let the, let the critics go where they may. I could care less about the critics anyway. Good. Now, there were a couple things that you talked about that you put under the label innovative. And, and mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're innovative overall within the martial arts, but I, I think it's a testament not only to your success as a martial arts instructor, but I'm guessing that it's a, a pretty solid reflection of who you are as a person and probably who you've been for a very long time. When you talked about the three steps in teaching, mm -hmm. tell them, show them, and do it with them. And it's that third part that I see so many martial arts instructors fall down with. Yeah. That they, they get a senior student to demonstrate everything. Right. I've actually, there, there are martial artists I know, high-ranking martial artists, who I have trained under, who, when they saw me, 
watching them practicing a form, stopped and walked away. Wow. I believe it. And then when you move your desk to the back of the room, you're not just observing them from a different angle. You're with them. Mm -hmm. The psychology of being up in front of the room, you've separated yourself. Your desk is facing the opposite direction. You're creating hierarchy. And kids don't resonate with that. And to me, those two acts, doing it with them, demonstrating it with them and showing that you are a martial artist, you're in the mix with them, just as you are sitting at a desk facing the same way. You're in it with them. Yes, sir. Is that something that you were taught explicitly or something you figured out on your own? Because I think it's a pretty fundamental and important thing. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to talk about it. Yeah, I figured it out on my own. My father is, oh, I'm getting emotional here. Woo. Give me a second. <clears throat> my father is sitting next to God. I know he is. I miss, I'm 53 years of age. Let me gather my thoughts here. I'm 53 years of age and I miss my daddy. I'm still saying, I, I still call him daddy. I miss my daddy every single day because we didn't finish what I was hoping to to do with him. And um, I miss my father so very much. Um, he was everything to me. The sun rose and set on that man. Um, he taught me a lot. He also did a lot of things that I would never do. Um, you know, he was a chain smoker. He was an alcoholic, my father. And because he was a chain smoker and because he was an alcoholic, that's why I am not a chain smoker. I am not an alcoholic. Um, there's a story that um, a friend of mine used to tell, me to cease now, uh, one of my dad's friends, I should say, how two people from the same household was watching their alcoholic and chain smoking parents. And one ended up becoming a doctor. And so how did you become a doctor? What was your defining moment or what propelled you? Because I didn't want to be a chain smoker and I didn't want to be an alcoholic. And they asked the other brother, what happened to you? What was your defining moment? How, how was, why, where was your downfall? You know what that brother said? I'm an alcoholic and a chain smoker because my parents were alcoholics and chain smokers. You see what I'm talking about? So mm -hmm. there's got to be a resolve deep down. There's got to be something. And that something is what my father instilled in me. And that something was my, my baseline, was my foundation, was my rock. God is my rock. He is my foundation. I will not be with the woman because she is pleasing to me. I will not make a friend with anyone because you know, he has, has friended me. I will pray on everything before I do it because God is my rock, my foundation. He is the author and finisher of my faith. He is the alpha and the omega in my life. So everything that I have done, I've made mistakes. Absolutely, I've made mistakes. But at the end of the day, I know I'm in alignment with the one who gives increase. So with that being said, that's where my innovation comes from, my creativity comes from, my, you know, being, you know, ingenuity, all that stuff comes from. I know I could live in any era, 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever era that God wanted me to live in, I know I could live in that era and be successful. I just know it. I was, my first year in law enforcement, after my probation was up, after nine months probation, Six months after that, I became a shift supervisor. That was the fastest that anyone had ever seen before in law enforcement. Trust me, I would walk in there, 80 people underneath me, and my mindset was still as, a, as, as you know, an officer, but my title said shift supervisor. How funny is that? And sometimes God would allow you to advance faster than your maturity. A lot of folks don't understand that. And your mind might be back where you came from, but your title says other. And so therefore, there's a struggle because now you got to catch up to what your title says. you got to catch up to where your money is. My money went from 70000 to well over $100,000.
being a college educated man and going to grad school. So I had all the credentials on paper, but my mindset was still back to where I was in line, uh, uh, like a line staff, an ordinary officer. So to answer your question again, it was just creativity. It was creativity. I like to do things that have never been done before. And that also comes from my last name being Bagwell. I was always the first person called in, in homeroom. I was always the first person called, uh, you know, to do something. I was always the first person to do this. I grew up in Groton, Connecticut, which was predominantly all white back in the early 70s. And I was the only black kid doing this, the only black kid doing that, the only black kid doing this. And I was good at it. You follow me? And when you're good at something, the, the, the crowd tends to follow you. And then, of course, I'm able to speak in complete sentences and, and talk and not stutter. And I have nice teeth and everything that goes along with that. And, it, and I was an automatic. I, was a, I automatically became a leader. Hmm. See, there is a leader and the leader. Are you familiar with that term? Um, I, I haven't heard anyone express it. I think I know where you're going, but you yeah. wouldn't mind if you yeah. explained it. Sure. I'll, I'll expound on it. A leader is just someone in a group that might be able to lead two or three people. But when a leader has a problem, they go to the leader, the head man or the head woman. And that's where the head woman or man has to make a decision. Now, you have 360-degree thinkers, and you have a 180-degree thinker. And let me expound on that. When you are a part of a karate school or a business or a household, the 180 degree thinker is going to think about things what are going to benefit him, her, self. But the 360 degree thinker is going to think about things that will benefit the entire family, the entire organization, the entire department. You understand? I do. So being a, being a business owner, I own two karate schools, praise God. So I am the leader who pays the bill, who has to handle this, who has to handle that. So I'm the pioneer in my family because no one in my family has ever even gone to high school and graduated. How funny is that? And I went to college and graduated. I went to grad school with my wife. I've been divorced since 06, but I went to grad school. So I'm the pioneer. So all the ups and the downs and the lefts and the rights and the pain, and is, is this what I'm supposed to feel at this stage? I couldn't go to Uncle John. I couldn't go to Aunt Sally and say, hey, is this how it's supposed to be? I didn't have anybody. I had nobody who I could go to. You can have mentors and you can have job coaches. Well, ultimately, you have to go through all that by yourself. So when you're an owner, of something that no one in your family has ever done. You're a pioneer. You're going to experience some things that you've never experienced before. You don't know how to handle it because you're saying, okay, um, okay, um, I got this karate school. Um, I know other karate school owners, um, but they did things their way. What am I supposed to do now? Um, I got to figure this out. I get on my knees and I pray to the one who gives increase. I've been here eight and a half years. And now my second karate school is being built. It's 5,200 square feet, my second karate school. Gorgeous, right in Groton, Connecticut. It's gorgeous. And so at the end of the day, I have to be able to handle all that. So you have to be creative. So to answer your question, there's a leader and the leader. Do you understand that part? I do. Great. Do you understand the difference between a 180-degree thinker and a 360 degree thinker. I do. Now, I don't know if you're married or not, and that's really none of my business, but if you are, if you have a girlfriend and you're, or if you're in a relationship, or whatever, you have kids and you're married, then you are, according to the Bible, to be different. But most households nowadays are funny. I won't go over here right now, but traditionally, the man is the leader. Okay. And so when there's a, whenever there's a problem, we go to the leader. If you own a karate school and something goes wrong with the bathroom or not enough, say, paper towels or cups or toilet tissue or 
whatever it is, they go to the leader. Now, if the leader has designated a leader to take care of those, quote unquote, household situations, then they're not, not going to come to you. You follow? I do. So, so, for, so for me, being the leader 24-7, seven, seven days a week, 365 days a year, I'm the leader. So every day I have to manage stress. I have to manage people. I have to manage ups and downs. And therefore, here comes my creativity. I've learned to put my secretary in charge of only a few things. Because if she messes up on the few things that I give her, then I don't have any trust in giving her anything else. And you don't want to do everything your way. But at the end of the day, you want to give things to people where their anointing is going to be. You know who you have. You got to know who your team are. You got to know who your team. You know, I have a parable for that too. But again, I don't want to get too long winded on certain things. But you're asking some very, very good questions. I, I have to admit, this is one of the best shows I've been on. I'd say the last year, year and a half. So thank you again for having me. Oh, thank you, thank you. There's one more question that sure. that I want to ask you because I, I think it. I think it's going to start to tie us together because at the end of the day, this is your story, but it's also a martial arts show. Yes. And one of my favorite things is showing the audience by bringing different people on from different backgrounds who have lived very different lives, that martial arts is something that is universally advantageous. Mm -hmm. Everyone trains is better for it. Might be a little bit, might be a lot. But as you're talking there, there's a there's a consistent theme here, and that is that not only, at least if I'm if I'm here, kind of reading between the lines accurately, it sounds like you believe you might have been set up for an average life or a mediocre life, and you rejected that, mm -hmm. and you rejected it very early. Mm -hmm. But you found a way to balance that rejection with loving that place that you came from, the people that you came from, which is, a very, again, a very difficult line to walk, just as difficult as how do we honor tradition of our arts and yet advance them? Mm -hmm. So is this... Are both of those coming from the same place? Is it, was, it, was it your start in martial arts that gave you the foundation to say, no, I love where I am, but I want to do more. I deserve more. I'm destined for more. Or was it from somewhere else? Man, I tell you, you're asking some deep questions and I can handle it. This is, you're awesome. You're an awesome interviewer. You. Man, I should have you on my talk show one of these days. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Happy to come on your show. You know? <laughs> if you're coming from Vermont, trust me, I'll take care of your hotel. I'll take care of your food. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm going to email you. Give me a Friday. No, I'm sorry. I tape, I tape my TV shows every, every other Wednesday in Groton. That's the closest one to you. I wouldn't have you come away out to Milford. Um, <laughs> to, sir, I'm, the difference between me driving to Groton and me driving to Milford, it's not that big. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's about like a 55 minute, you know, extra. Um, but I would have you in my Groton um, show. It's just, you know, it's just, you know, short or dry for you. Um, but definitely, I will definitely have you um, on my TV show. I think you're awesome, man. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I'm going to take a deep breath. This is twofold. This is twofold. Um, great question once again. And let me control my emotions because you're taking me back to the absolute rawness of who Herbie Bagwell Jr. is. And this is, this is going back to my absolute rawness. Okay. 19, oh gosh, I don't even know what year it was. It was uh, seventh grade. And this is what makes me who I am. One of the major reasons makes me who I am today. But again, great question, but it's twofold. First, 
um, I was living with my mother in Grok. I can say this now because I'm 53, but then I couldn't tell anybody because <laughs> they wouldn't allow me to get to school. There. <laughs> so I can say it out in public now. <laughs> um, I was living with my mother in Groton, Connecticut, and she had this beautiful condominium and condo. And uh, my half brother, Michael, he had the same mom, but different father, um, was on drugs. And he, he hit me and I called my father and my father drove from New London to Groton and he really laid into my older half brother verbally, not physically, but laid into him physically, I mean, ver- uh, verbally, excuse me. And my father said to me, he was big Herbie, so I'm a little Herbie. My father goes, little Herbie, pack your bag. You're going to come live with me since your mother can't keep you safe over here. My mother just went upstairs to her bedroom and closed the door. I was like, wow. To me, that blew my mind. I was like, wow, you're not even going to argue or fight for me. Wow. But that was also the beginning of me having, say, son and mommy issues, which I worked out later in my early 20s, thank God. So no female issues here. <laughs> That's important. Um, so my father and I moved together in his small one-bedroom apartment. And I want to be honest with you right now, I am fighting back the tears. I'm open, I'm honest, but I can handle it. So my father was broke. Sir. He had absolutely nothing, but he loved his son. He loved me. He had to borrow a car to come pick me up. Now, at this point, what's seventh grade? Like 12, 13, right? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So my dad was at this point, let's see, he died at 64. So my dad was like 59 at this point. Okay. And my mm-hmm. father had uh, cancer at that point. Um. He had half of, half of a lung removed because of cancer. He was very fragile, weak. He had nothing. He, trust me, he had no money. He had absolutely nothing. My, father, my father's rent and utilities were being paid by a program, and my dad was living off of $10 a week. Take your time. So when I moved out from my mom's house, or condo rather, it was on a Friday, I remember. And my father and I were together all day Saturday. I was just like laying next to him watching TV on this small little 20 inch, whatever it was, um, black and white TV with bunny ears. <laughs> UHF, I remember the ears. Yeah, UHF, VHF, whatever the heck it was. And uh, I remember we were contemplating on was I going to go and stay in Groton? public school or transfer to New London public school. And my dad said, no, stay in Groton. I will figure out a way of getting you to school every single day. Now, this is January. It's cold out there, my man. (laughs) Okay. This is winter time. It's freezing. And this is where the start of my strength, my resolve, my determination, my motivating factor of not being broke and destitute comes from, there's a phrase in the black culture that says, don't be broke, busted, and disgusted. (laughs) And this is where all this came from. And I remember now it's 
Sunday. We would walk to church. We'd come back home. There was something called um, scrapple, which tastes like sausage. <laughs> and my father would make scrapple, um, eggs and cheese, toast. I like my toast with little butter, little jelly on it. <laughs> and my dad would make um, his black coffee, which I still can't drink black coffee. I just can't do it. I got to have some cream and sugar, bro. I can't do it. And um, <laughs> and uh, and we were together. It was just me and my father. And um, but now it's Sunday afternoon. How can we get me to school <coughs> for Monday morning? Excuse me. My father borrowed someone's car for Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday. And all of the people who my father used to help out financially, that same person that was allowing my father to use his car turned his back on my dad. How funny is that? My father was betrayed by his friend. Out of the blue, my father gets a check in the mail for about like $300, saying that they underpaid him whatever it was, and there was a bike um, at the local bike shop right up the street from my dad's apartment. And for some reason, this number stays in my brain. The bike cost $112.62. So my dad got the money up out of that check. We walked up there. He bought the bike for me. My dad goes, listen, little Herbie, you're going to have to ride your bike to school every day and come home. Now, this is what you have to understand. From where my father lived in New London, you have to travel at least six minutes by car from where my dad lived to get to the bridge. You got to travel maybe, you know, four or five minutes over the bridge by car. And another 10 minutes over after the bridge to my school. Now we're talking about 11, 12 year old kid, myself, riding a bike from where my father lived to the bridge over the bridge and I had to ride my bike from that bridge to school every day in the rain, in the sleet, in the snow. This is January, my man. Mm. But here's the kicker. Never mind what I was going through. I can only imagine how my father felt feeling inadequate and not being able to help his son to get to school. I can only, I I can't even fathom what he is feeling because my kids have iPhone, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Um, 8 Plus, is that how you pronounce it? (laughs) My (laughs) My kids have iPhone 8 Pluses. My kids have digital this, digital that. Daddy, can I have? They can walk into a beautiful karate school. They don't have to ask anybody for a job. I can just give them a job. And they can make three, four hundred dollars a week if they want to. They can borrow daddy's brand new car, whatever. My father didn't have this at my age. He didn't have it. My father was broke. He didn't have a damn thing. He didn't have anything. So when I look back on that, I'm like, wow, look where I am today. So I had to ride that bike, sir, over that bridge, January, February, and the beginning of March. My father got a huge settlement for thousands of dollars. And my father, because of me, he moved from New London to Groton 
so I could be able to walk to school from then on in. So you got to understand something, man. People don't understand my, they don't understand my praise because they don't understand my story. They don't understand why I, I have a love of God because they don't understand what I've been through. But praise God, I don't look like what I went through. <laughs> praise God of that. So that's, that's, this is twofold, but that's, that's the first part. So that's where the, the, the integrity of self, the, the self-motivation, the determination, the I will not quit. Don't even use that Q-U-I-T word around me. Don't use it's too hard around me. Don't, I don't, I don't want to hear it. Don't tell me you can't do something. I've jumped out of airplanes. I've driven, I, I, I have a NASCAR background. You can just. Look, just Google Herbie Bagwell, geez. I don't get into it. We'll be here all day. <laughs> but uh, you, may have to, you may have to edit this, this interview. I don't know how long you want it to be. But I have six resumes, six modeling, res- modeling resumes, acting resume. I have a NASCAR resume. I have a work resume. Okay? I have um, a personal trainer resume. I write diets. I do um, supplementation. I help people out with, you know, with their diets and how to lose weight. So I have six resumes. So there's no such thing as being an overachiever. It's about people valuing who you are to stay in your life. And if they don't value who you are, then hold the door open for them. Or you can tell them, don't let the door hit you in the backside on your way out. Because you cannot be around someone who don't know who you are. So let me prove that. Jesus had how many disciples? He had 12. You understand? Mm-hmm. And out of the 12 disciples, when stuff got really deep, when Jesus really had to go somewhere, he only took what? Three disciples, Peter, James, and John. You understand? Mm-hmm. That tells people right there, that tells me that you have to watch who is in your corner. You just can't invite everybody on your team. You just can't. You can't. You cannot fly as high as God wants you to be with just anybody on your team. You've got to carefully choose the people around you. You have to think like an eagle and have an attitude of excellence. You have to. So not everyone's going to be around you. Not everyone's going to understand the decision that you make. That's okay. See you later. I'll, I'll, look, how come you don't go out much? My question to you is, I don't see you at the bank much. <laughs> you understand? You understand? It. Yeah. So at the end of the day, like they say, all these memes on social media, you have to do what the one percent will do, and then you can look at the other ninety-nine and just shake your head why they're not willing to sacrifice and struggle and go through something to be like the one percent. I'm not going to die broke. I already know that for a fact. I'm not. I can't guarantee tomorrow's Wednesday, but I guarantee you one thing. I will not die broke. I'm not. I have goals. I have dreams, aspirations, and my prayers are being met as we speak. Because no matter what happens in my life, I pray to the one who gives increase, the one who moves mountains, the one who stopped the sun for Joshua, the one who parted the Red Sea for Moses, the one who can, can move stars, the one that can move mountains the one that clothes the lilies of the field and feeds the birds of the air. That's who I pray to. I pray to the one who woke me up this morning. I pray to my Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider, so I know I'm protected and I'm safe. And God has kept me here for a reason because there are things that people need from me while I'm here. That's why God has kept me. People need something from me because I matter, because I, because God values me. So I don't care what man thinks. God values me. That's why I'm still here. So now, just to prove that point with Peter, James, and John, now I'm going to get even deeper. I've been betrayed at the highest level. I've been betrayed at the highest level by family. I've been betrayed, my man. Jesus was betrayed at the highest level. And what did Peter do? Jesus said, you're going you're gonna to deny me three times before the cock crows. And when Jesus was taken to in, in custody, 
and they were going to get ready to crucify him, a lady recognized Peter as being one of Jesus' disciples. And, and Peter denied Jesus three times. Isn't that something? Judas mm-hmm. also betrayed Jesus. And Judas couldn't live with himself. So what did, what did Judas do? He hung himself. And here's the funny part. When he was walking through Galilee, they all kept saying, is that the Messiah? Is he the son of God? Is that the Messiah? Is he the son of God? And when Jesus got around all of his disciples, Jesus asked a question to all of his disciples. Who say, who say you, who am I? In other words, who am I, disciples? Who am I to you? Who am I to the world? He asked the question to all his disciples. Only one spoke up. It was Peter. And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You are the Lamb who lights the world. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, why didn't the other 11 speak up? You see what I'm talking about? I do. You cannot have people around you, sir, who do not know who you are. I don't care if it's your children. I don't care if it's your wife. I don't care if it's coworkers. I don't care if it's the best friend since elementary school, first grade. If they don't know who you are, you can't grow with them. You can't because they don't value who you are. That's why success is lonely because a lot of folks are not going to be able to go with you where God is going to bring you. And a lot of folks don't want nothing in life. They don't want to be successful. They don't want to go through any pain, any struggles. They don't want to go through it. People want to go, they want to wake up nine to five, eight to four, seven to three, come home, eat, watch TV, Kiss the kids, kiss the wife, go to sleep. Next day, guess what? They want to go to work. Seven to three, eight to four, nine to five, and do the same thing all over again. And they don't want nothing. It doesn't make them a bad person, but they just don't want nothing. There's more to life than that. The last part of part part A is when it's time for me to go to heaven, when St. Peter brings brings into my room, and he opens the door, I want all of my shelves empty. What that phrase means that God has a lot of stored up gifts for you, for me, for everybody. And if we don't go after everything that we want down here on earth, I don't want to go in my room and see, wow, what's that gifts for? Well, that's the book, Herb, that you didn't write, that God wanted you to write. It was going to be a number one seller, but you didn't write the book. What's that gifts over there? Well, that's the gift, Herbie, that you are going to get. Um, Because after you were to jump out of an airplane, you'd have an attitude that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Wow. Well, what's that gift over there? Well, that gift over there, Herb, is because you had an opportunity of opening up a second karate school that would have been phenomenal in your hometown. And you didn't do it. See, I don't want that. I want every gift that I have right here on earth so I can be a blessing and share it to other people. You understand? I do. Lastly, here comes the part B. There's a phrase I'm going to say, and I'm going to explain it. And a lot of people don't understand what I'm getting ready to say. And I'll break it down to you so you can understand it. And it goes like this. They came out from us that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. For had they been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. One more time. It's from Apostle Paul. They came out from us that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. For had they been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. And what that means is you find out who is with you and who left you. Do you understand that part? I do. If they're with you, no matter what you go through, no matter what you go through, if they're still in your life today, that means that they are of you. But because they came from you and they're not with you today, then they're not of you. They were never your, they were never with you to begin with. They were never with you to begin with. And out of everything that I said today, that's the one thing that you might want to replay and write it down and put it in your car, uh, put it in your, in, you know, in your, in your wallet, 
uh, pin it someplace on the refrigerator because that right there tells you everything. If people are for you, they're going to be for you. And if they're not going to be for you, they're going to show you in their actions. You know how it goes. It's not what you say. It's what you do that defines you. So, again, you know, I'm a very spiritual man. I'm humble. I'm always listening to people. I can learn from everybody either what to do or what not to do or either what to say or what not to say or how to be and how not to be. I'm not angry at anyone. I have forgiven everybody in my life who has betrayed me, who tried to discredit me. I have forgiven everyone who was disloyal to me. I have forgiven them all because I'm not going to allow anyone to have power over me where, I, where I'm still holding a grudge. Uh-uh. I forgive all of them. And because I forgive all of them, that's why God has kept me for so long at this karate school here in Milford, and he has allowed me to open up a second one. The flooring has to be installed pretty soon, praise God. But all is well. But at the end of the day, you know, God has kept me, and, and that's why I'm still here. But I'm still here productively. I'm still here creatively. Um, I'm still here to be a blessing to other people. So Tay Kempo Martial Arts is based upon all of that. So when you see Tay Kempo, yeah, my man, there's a whole lot behind that. And, <laughs> and now I understand you, why there's a book. Yeah, now I understand why there's a book. And, you know, the first book is not going to have all of what we discussed as far as my personal convictions and my resolve. But it will have a lot as far as what Tay Kempo Martial Arts is and my mission statement and what I hope to leave as my lasting legacy. You know, legacies are huge. You know, I just found out today, um, I'm a fan of Urban Meyer. He is the Ohio State football uh, coach out there in Ohio. And he just announced that he's retiring after their, after their bowl game. I think it's the Rose Bowl where the Ohio State is going. And he's retiring. And what they want to know is what his lasting legacy is going to be. But because over the past year, year and a half, it was tainted by a close coach of his for domestic issues, um, domestic violence issues, they don't know what kind of a legacy he will leave. They always want to say it's health reasons, but there's always more than that. There's always more than that. So, but again, um, this was very enlightening. I did not even remotely believe that I would be asked these wonderful, deep, pertinent questions um, I'm going to tell you right now, you're the best interviewer I've ever witnessed and was a part of. So you're the best, man. I What an honor. Yeah, you are awesome, man. This is, uh, I got to have you on my TV show. Um, we'll do it. Please, I want you to email me um, yeah, yeah. On Wednesday. Oh, of course, after the holidays. Um, yeah. On yeah, a we'll, Wednesday. We'll that, you know, that, We're not going to stop talking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that you're We're free. not going to stop talking. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because I might, uh, there might be a huge announcement um, in sport karate that I'm going to make possibly over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to cool my heels, like my Ooh. father would say, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to let this current situation play itself out because I've always learned, you know, Jehovah Jireh is my provider, but anyone that comes to me that tries to harm me in any way, God will turn it around to my advantage. So what is meant for my harm, God will turn it around to my advantage. So um, I'm going to let go and let God, you know, do it his way. Let God do the mending. And I'm just going to stay in faith and just know that uh, I'm in alignment with him. But again, wonderful interview questions. Um, Thanks. This was great. You're one of the best. You're the best, you know, interviewer I've ever, ever had. And I hope people who here does not offended, but you are all. <laughs> you are well, thank you. And before I let you go, a couple, a couple of things. If people are listening and they want to learn more about you or Ty Kempo, you know, mm -hmm. how do they find you on the web, on social media, you know, throw out some accounts, some web names. Oh, I'm easy. They can go on to, well, my website, I already emailed it to you, but it's bagwell, Um, Just so people know, you don't have to write that www dot anymore. <laughs> That's right. That is so. That's right. Drives me crazy when I see it in advertising. 
Yeah, it's so eighty something. You know, some some of these um, emails and websites, um, you put it in there because you don't know how people have set up their email accounts. But you can just type in your phone or on a computer. You know, bagwelltakekempo.com, and boom, you get there. It's just no big deal. Or just uh, go on to any social media. I'm on Facebook, Herbie Bagwell. Um, you'll see me and my kids, beautiful, you know, black and white photo on Instagram. It's Tay Kempo, um, on Instagram or just plug in Herbie Bagwell. Once again, it pops up, um, LinkedIn. I don't do Twitter. I'm not a big Twitter guy. Um, if I was big as, you know, Kanye or, you know, some singer, you know, I would, you know, um, Shania Twain or whatever, I'd be on Twitter. But, um, you know, I, I am on Twitter. It's hbagwell777. But the most ones that I'm on mostly is Facebook, Kirby Bagwell, and, of course, Instagram, which is Tay Kempo. And my website, once again, is bagwelltaykempo.com. Awesome. Awesome. And one more thing. Anything. Not that you haven't given us a, a ton today, but I always ask the guests, you know, give us a, a, a closing bit. Give us some parting words of wisdom, however you want to term it and send us out. Yep. Well, in closing, first again, I want to thank you for having me on this, you know, on your, on your show. And to all the listeners, um, God bless you all and have a safe and wonderful and blessed and prosperous holiday season and new year. And in closing, basically treat people the way that you want to be treated. Always be kind to people because you don't know what people are going through day to day, especially in the holiday season. But if you can just be kind to people, no matter what season it is, winter, spring, summer, fall, just be kind to people because you don't know what they're going through. And what I've always learned, too, is just because you hear X, Y, and Z about someone, if you don't know that someone, get to know that someone. Just don't take what you heard for face value and run with it. That's so immature. It's so, <clears throat> excuse me, juvenile. Um, but Again, um, being a Tay Kempo practitioner of Taekwondo and Shaolin Kempo martial arts, it's a lifestyle for me. Um, it's what I do, but who I am, I'm a man of God. I'm a warrior of God. I'm a father. I'm a good father. I'm a good brother. I'm a good friend. I'm a great listener. And yes, ladies, I'm single. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, I always keep God first place. And uh, once again, I hope you have me get on your show. And again, just always be kind to people because you don't know what people are going through. That's it. We all walk a different path. And we all learn lessons as we walk that path. But I think one of the keys to getting the most out of life is being willing to look behind you and in front of you and draw connections and understand how your past influences your future but not in a way that you're beholden to it. We can always move on. We can always grow. We can always rise up. And that's something that Kyoshi taught us today. In fact, I would say it was the thing that he talked about the most. The ability to move forward and grow into the person that you want to be requires at least a bit of a nod to the past and a willingness to charge forward. So thank you, sir. I appreciate your time on the show. And thanks for educating all of us. If you want to check out the show notes, including links, photos, so much more, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter. We send out discounts. We let you know what's going on behind the scenes, new projects, tons of good stuff going on at Whistlekick. And that's really the best way to stay on top of what's happening. If you want to support us, you can do so by shopping at whistlekick.com using the code PODCAST15. If you have a martial arts school, you should probably sign up for the wholesale program because we give you some discounts, work with you, help you sell Whistlekick products. Everybody wins in that equation, don't they? And if you want to reach out to us, find us on social media, you can do so. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. My email address, my direct email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And I reply to everything that I get. I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support, for your love. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.